Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest and California Weather Watch. Today is October 22nd, and right now we're going to take a look at the most recent uh, La Nina slash Enso updates here, and we're going to go ahead and dive through everything here. We'll take a look at some of this data, and I'll try to explain some of what the Climate Prediction Center looks at when they talk about their seasonal forecasting. But first of all, what is a La Nina or El Nino? We will we measure the water, the temperature anomaly here across the equatorial Pacific. This is plus and minus five degrees north and south latitude right along the equator between 170 and 120 west. So this is the area that we measure that from. And right now we are in La Nina watch, which means below average temperatures water wise there across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So if we go ahead and take a look here, we have different things where we can kind of tell where we are. Uh, SS uh, Enso right here. This is El Nino neutral or La Nina conditions. And there's also other things that come into play, such as the Madden-Julian Oscillation. This tends to be more sub-seasonal. It moves through in 30 to 60 day time frames. The ENSO you know, factor of that, it tends to be more seasonal. It can be on the scale of months. And there's different ways we tell if we are in El Nino or La Nina condition, not just the ocean temperatures, because we kind of look at these pressure patterns. This is known as the Southern Oscillation Index. Here. And so if we're in positive La Nina, we have lower pressure out here for Darwin, the maritime continent there and that's where we get the cloud activity and we get the deeper convection out here across the western pacific ocean and we get the higher pressure here and the reverse is true during el nino when we are in negative soi pressure patterns more on that here coming up in a moment but this is the madden julian oscillation so you can see that you got the increased rainfall cloud cover here and then this kind of cycles around the planet every 30 to 60 days so that's why i said it was sub-seasonal but this can enhance and kind of take away from el nino or la nina conditions as well it's why we sometimes here on the west coast of north america we get some rainy periods and sometimes we get drier and cooler than normal here it's because they got el nino and things like the madden julian oscillation fighting things out and, and if you take a look here rainfall during ENSO versus rainfall during Madden Julian oscillation you can see when they're in phase you can be you know abnormally wet but when you're also in phase you can be abnormally dry or you could have one wet that's one dry and it kind of evens things out so uh, kind of interesting how these oscillations do work with each other and you can see this is the current atmospheric and oceanic conditions here according to the Climate Prediction Center you can see the mentor mention ENSO neutral conditions right now they continue and they do talk about the Madden Julian oscillation being active here. So if you hear me talking about that upcoming, I'll do my best as we go through the season here to try to explain what is going on with the Madden Julian oscillation and whatnot and what kind of conditions we're in. I'll always be mentioning that. And I'll mention if we have the classic La Nina versus El Nino setups, which we'll talk about more again, actually starting right now. So you can see the average Madden Julian oscillation cloud and wind patterns here. And you can kind of see how the jet stream is stronger at times, depending on the phase of the Madden Julian Julian oscillation as it tracks from west to east across the equatorial regions here and this will circle around the planet and come back out across Africa and the Indian Ocean then the maritime continent and push off to uh, the east but it all it doesn't always just phase across the planet either sometimes it's weak and it's very nebulous and it's difficult to detect just where the MJO is so sometimes it's not having big impacts on our weather and where the MJO is and especially where the El Nino and La Nina and what's going on across the Equatorial Pacific makes a big difference with what we know as Rossby waves here and you can see as these waves break and get high pressure setting up here low pressures and uh, depending on El Nino or La Nina or what's going on with the Madden Julian oscillation you can get stuck in some of these patterns where you're windier than normal or rainier than normal or drier than normal and warmer than normal so if we take a look here, I, this is the same thing basically here, but you can kind of see it. Uh, you can imagine the higher pressure here, the warmer air going up towards the polar regions, and then the cooler air dropping back down. And that's what's known as these Rossby waves. This is a constant battle to balance out the atmosphere that the Earth it can never win. That's why there's always weather going on somewhere across the planet. And if we take, again, one more look, you can imagine how, or the, the, for example, when we're in El Nino conditions, you know, you've got the cooler, the normal water out here, or, and that tends to be warmer than normal out here across the equatorial Pacific and the Madden Julian oscillation. Then you've got these phases that move across as well. And those can work in tandem to bring strong jet streams and atmospheric rivers into the West Coast of North America. Or like I said, you can get the reverse where drier than normal conditions and less stormy than normal conditions do exist. 
possessed. Where are we right now? So currently we are in neutral conditions here, but we are dropping down. In fact, last week we were at a negative 0.5. So we're kind of oscillating back and forth, close to getting in towards the La Nina conditions. We're technically in the La Nina watch right now. This was actually updated yesterday on October 21st. And if we take a look all the way back towards November 2023 here, you can see the warmer water that was in place last year's El Nino clearly. And then you can see the changes that were coming through as we went through the spring months. And you can see that cooler water kind of making its way across the equatorial Pacific, making its way out towards 170 West. But you notice we still have some above average pockets out there as well. It's not been as quick of a transition towards La Nina as initially thought. And right now we're still scheduled to be in the La Nina conditions but we're just expected to be in the week La Nina, but that doesn't mean that you can't have active weather here in the Pacific Northwest or the state of California also. And we'll look at some of those numbers coming up here in a moment. And again, one more time here, you can see Nino 3.4 as we drop down from last year's El Nino, and we are now into some negative territories here, starting to close in on in the, El, the La Nina conditions here. And you can see that negative 0 0.3. There's also Nino 1.2, 1 plus 2 uh, against uh, the coast of uh, South America there. And there's Nino 3 in the red, and Nino 4 would be in the yellow. And you can see those temperatures trends as well. So this is the official seasonal forecast. This blue dashed line is the La Nina threshold, and we are still forecast to get down below there. Again, a weak La Nina is what is favored as of right now. And more on that here. Actually, this is it right now, what I was debating on whether to mention here because I knew I had the slide ready to go. So let's take a look here. 2008 record snows were during a week La Nina. The December 2008 was the snowiest month since I've been alive. And we were just on the borderline. In fact, initially when we were going through this, I believe that four months were La Nina, but then we didn't officially qualify for the La Nina. They've kind of updated some of this, the temperature anomalies here, but we did just qualify for that week La Nina. And so, you know, we got some pretty extreme snowfalls here across some of the Pacific Northwest during the month of December. So just because it's weak doesn't mean you can't have some dynamic uh, weather activity here. Now, taking a look at the probabilities, as we go through uh, uh, November, December, and January, we're right about 75% chance, but neutral is there, and it's kind of looming. You can see the probability bars, and then we scroll on in towards next year, and you can kind of see how it looks like we're headed towards neutral, and then, you know, El Nino starts to creep up a little bit here, kind of equal odds between La Nina and El Nino at that point. So uh, again, La Nina favor to come up here as we go through September through November, and if not, then probably by December, this was updated October 10th. Now, going back, you can kind of see how we go through these phases of sometimes being in neutral conditions versus El Nino back in 2015, 16, a pretty strong one there. And then we went back to La Nina. And uh, from 2020 to 2023, we went through this triple dip La Nina, and then we went through this El Nino, and we're already swinging back towards La Nina conditions. And you can see officially for the month of August, negative uh, 0.1. Now, the European has kind of been throwing some curveballs at us because on September 1st, it had, uh, you know, uh, approaching moderate La Nina, let's call it here. But you can see as we've updated through October 1st, it still has that La Nina flavor going on, but not quite as robust. And I did this one for October, November, and December 2024. This one goes out to January. You can still see we're favoring La Nina here, but definitely weaker than what the models were showing a month ago. And that shows up here as well. And the blue line is what actually happened. We're all the way back for September 2022. The model's doing pretty good overall. You can kind of see the blues are within the envelope of the European Ensemble members as we go through October, we went through into December, and you can kind of see, I'm just going to scroll through this fairly quickly. I've talked about this uh, during previous monthly updates here, but uh, you can see actually the temperatures that occurred were on the lower side of the Ensemble members here as we went through August 2023. Then we scrolled off in towards December. We went through that La Ni uh, El Nino period, and then now we're going back down towards neutral here as we get to January 2024, and the model's still doing a pretty good job. But as we got in towards March 2024, you can kind of see how we were on the warm side of the ensemble members. We thought we were going to be dropping down towards La Nina conditions quite a bit more rapid than we actually did. And there is April 2024 as well. And you can see again, May on the warmer side of those ensemble members, we were scheduled to get down towards La Nina and we didn't quite get there. Here we go through July, August here. And you can kind of see in August, it was like, hey, are we even going to get to La Nina? We might stay right here in neutral territory. And then we went to September and it was like, okay, now we're going to go 
to La Nina, and that black line would be where La Nina conditions are. But then the October 1st one comes out here, and it kind of throws us another curveball. Officially, the forecast does have us dropping down, but the European is like, eh, not so fast. We may remain in neutral conditions. And if you take a look at what's been going on the last 30 days, I have this uh, animation running here, uh, and you can see the colder than normal waters from between 170 and 120 west. And you can see we, we still do have this cold pool kind of off the coastline here, but underneath this at depth, there has been some warm pockets moving around as well. But it does resemble La Nina right here, and we do have the Pacific Decadal Oscillation uh, negative right now and this leads to that warmer water out here so this is kind of interesting we have the La Nina and kind of the cooler water is here on the eastern Pacific versus the western Pacific so sometimes the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and uh, La Nina can work in tandem and bring cooler than normal winters here for the Pacific Northwest especially so under normal conditions we have these trade winds we have the kind of the current of the Pacific Ocean here and the winds flow like this in a clockwise rotation here and it bunches up this warmer water in the Western Pacific Ocean. And this is known as what's normal or neutral conditions. When you get La Nina, though, you increase these trade winds and you pull that water from below in depth and it comes across the equatorial Pacific as cooler than normal. Let me back that back up. And then you can see we get this warm water building up here. And, you know, Asia is a cold place, Siberia in the winter time, And you can imagine the temperature contrast there between this warmer than normal water versus the cold continental air. You get these strong jet streams that can rip out across the Pacific ocean and downstream you get these breaking waves and you get this variable jet stream that can bring cooler than normal or wetter than normal potential here for the pacific northwest and some of the west coast of north america as we go on into the winter months so if we take a look at here, notice how the precipitable water is concentrated in the Western Pacific Ocean. Pretty typical, again, even normal conditions, we tend to get that because of the trade winds kind of bringing that surface heated water across the equatorial Pacific into the Western Pacific here. And of course, that gets enhanced during La Nina. And you can see when the Earth always wants to transfer this heat back towards the polar regions here. And once this builds up, you build these big jet streams. And classic La Nina conditions are those strong jet streams ripping off the continent of Asia. And then you get the breaking waves downstream. You get big ridges out here across the Gulf of Alaska that can introduce some of those cooler air masses back in, down into the Pacific Northwest. Now, again, neutral conditions. This is what's known as the Walker circulation. Here's the equator. And again, you got the trade winds bunching up some of that water over here. And during La Nina, you enhance that exact flow. And El Nino is the reverse with a, a, the deep tropical convection is more out over the equatorial Pacific here. So it tends to bring warmer air into the West Coast of North America. And how do we know if the walker circulation is starting to show El Nino conditions? Well, if you've watched this before, you know that it's by looking at the Southern Oscillation Index. And again, we measure the pressure at Tahiti versus Darwin. El Nino conditions, it's lower in Tahiti and higher than Darwin. So the trade winds aren't quite as strong pushing off to the Western Pacific Ocean there. And you get the deeper convection out over the Central Pacific. Of course, during El Nino, there we go again, what I just talked about, but La Nina conditions here, lower pressure is back towards Darwin, higher pressure here is towards Tahiti. So we monitor these pressure values here, and we've just now started to move back into positive territory. So that is technically starting to favor a La Nina flavor here for the atmosphere. You know, it, it's not much right now, but the last 30 and 90 days here do have us into positive territory there. And we've kind of been swapping back and forth a little bit here as we go through the month of September. Technically, we we're still just a little bit into negative territory, today, but very close, kind of making the atmosphere look like it was in neutral conditions. You can see our triple dip La Nina here and then our El Nino of last year, but it wasn't as strong as previous strong El Ninos have been, for example. Now, taking a look at what everybody wants to know about here is the seasonal temperature outlook. This is November, December, January, and we have equal chances for the Pacific Northwest. Some above average across the Southwest USA, but look at that above average for precipitation. And if we start to uh, take a December, January, and February into account, look at this below normal signature here, and that is no doubt to the La Nina conditions expected across some of the Pacific Ocean there. And above average signal is there as well. So, you know, not a bad bet to kind of hedge your bets towards a little bit snowier mountains here, especially across the Rockies, maybe BC and Alberta and the Cascades there usually favors La Nina years. 
Um, if we take a look at the, uh, January through March, same signal there as well. Above average just continues all the way on in through the early spring, but low normal temperatures as well. And this is actually pretty nice also. U.S. seasonal drought outlook, drought tendency during the valid period. This is October 17th. Look at Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and western Montana. Drought remains but improves in the tan there. The green is drought removal likely for much of Oregon, much of Washington, Idaho, and some of western Montana where there is some extreme and exceptional drought. So this is very nice to see. And this goes all the way. This is basically from October 17th through uh, January 31st. So hopefully that is the case and the above average precipitation verifies and we can uh, bless some of Western Montana with that as well. And, you know, maybe set the stage for not such a nasty fire season as we go on in through next year. Uh, something interesting, I do like to show the SeaTac snowfall by season as we go all the way back to the winter of 49 through 50. I've got the blues as moderate or strong El Nino, uh, La Ninas, and the lighter blues here are weak uh, La Ninas. And as we scroll on through here, um, you can see as we go out towards uh, December 8 and 9, I should have put this one as a light blue here. I, I might have messed that up, but you can see we had that very snowy December here. So, yeah. La Nina there. You can see El Nino doesn't necessarily mean you don't get any snow at fall at all. As the winter of 68 and 69, I know a lot of old timers out there that remember that winter very fondly. But if you take a look here, classically uh, El Nino years have very little snowfall here, especially strong ones. It, the only seasons in SeaTac history since 1950 to have zero snowfall are all El Nino. Every single La Nina season has had some measurable snowfall at Sea Tacos. So if you want to, you know, make a bet with a friend or whatnot and have him buy a meal or something, you can bet him that you're going to see measurable snowfall here at Sea Tac as we go through this upcoming season. And you can see our last year, our El Nino year, only 0.3 inches of snowfall. You can also see our triple dip. We did have snowfall each and every season, almost 13, 9 inches, and 7 inches uh, shown there. So, this is something interesting for Los Angeles, California, El Nino versus La Nina temperatures. You can see as we go on in through October, November, and December, we're typically below um, what we would usually be here for with El Nino conditions. And yeah, it's kind of interesting, a little bit of a trend for some cooler temperatures there. Same thing happens with January and February. Februarys are noticeably cooler here during La Nina seasons as well as Marches and you know April, pretty big difference there also. If we look at some of the Cascades as well, you can see it generally favors La Nina, but it is no slam dunk. But the big years generally are La Nina years across the Cascades. Um, I've talked about this before here. We've been exceptionally warm across a lot of the oceans, so sometimes it throws a loop into some of our readings out there. Because if we have the La Nina setup going on there and a lot of the oceans are above normal and the, the La Nina, you know, the equatorial Pacific there is below normal, that can, you know, there's still some room to study things there. It'll be interesting to see over the next few decades just what happens as we go through, you know, the, the globe is warming here. It's just the facts, you know. I just report the facts and um, it'll be interesting to watch this. You can see 2023 and 2024, pretty, pretty stark signal for very warm uh, oceans across the planet. Um, but yeah, that's what I got for you here. Hopefully you guys are enjoying these videos. Let me know in comments below what else you want to hear me talk about. Um, I plan on doing my normal briefings again tomorrow. We're still watching that windstorm. It's going to be moving out across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, what else? Um, hope you guys are having a good night. Otherwise, I plan to go out there and shoot a little bit of the comet here and see what I can capture. Hopefully, you know, it may be the last gasp here because it's getting a bit dimmer. And, of course, it is moving away from us, and that's the reason why. But we do have clear skies tonight, so I'm going to take the camera out and see if I can't get one last glimpse of that comet. Otherwise, hope you guys are having a good night. We'll do this all again tomorrow. I'll do my normal briefings, California and Pacific Northwest Weather Channel, and I will talk to you guys then.